God and my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, When it's evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. So you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. <clears throat> An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And then he left him, and he went away. <clears throat> I got a sign a second ago there. Did you hear that one? <laughs> Not again. Well, that's how Jesus uh, is, starts out with, in, the, in this chapter from the Gospel of Matthew. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are at it again. They're, they're, they're after Jesus. They have repudiated Jesus at every turn. They've asked for signs everywhere he goes. And... and they just don't get who Jesus is. They're looking for something else. And so they keep asking for this sign. Are you that, that Messiah that, that was promised to us? That Davidic, that, that Messiah after David, a, a warrior king? And he doesn't give them really an answer except to say, the sign that I will leave with you is the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Anybody? Anybody want to call that out? What happened to Jonah? He was in three days. He was in the belly of a giant fish. We say whale. The Bible doesn't say whale. But we'll say whale. He's in the belly of a whale for three days and then is spewed out on land alive. So Jesus is alluding to that because he's talking about his own death and resurrection. I'll be in the earth for three days, and I will rise again. But they don't get it. They don't know what he's talking about. They have no clue. Even his disciples don't have sufficient faith to understand who Jesus is and, and what the mission of Jesus is. They're still thinking, like the rest of Israel, this is going to be, we want a, a warrior king like David Jesus had already warned them, though, that if you're going to take up my, my cross, if you're going to follow me, some things might happen to you that you might not like. And he tells them about two chapters before this. He says things like this. Rejoice and be glad if you're my disciples, for your reward is great in heaven. Well, I'm buying that. But it goes, for in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who went before you. Now he's telling them, they're persecuting me. If you're going to be my disciples, they're going to persecute you. Be prepared. But they don't quite get it. They don't quite get it. Christians may expect persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that right now. It's not pie in the sky by and by always. But your reward is in heaven. Jesus gives us that first. So anyway, Jesus takes his disciples away from there, and they head northwards to Caesarea Philippi, which is the paganist, pagan city in that area. It's full of temples. It's full of little grottos where people go and worship and, and give offerings to Pan and other gods. There's, there's all kinds of pagan activities going on there. And Jesus takes them. It's about 25 miles away from where they are now. And by the way, it's uphill all the way. I just want you to know that. Actually is. It's 1,700 feet they travel uh, in height. But to go 25 miles, now they're in pagan territory, and Jesus decides to reveal himself in pagan territory. Why didn't he reveal himself in the temple in Jerusalem? Why was, when they were all gathered around and he was teaching, preaching, did he say, I'm the Messiah? He picks pagan territory, which, which is hostile. But it tells us that God moves where God will move. And that he demonstrates, in my thinking, that by moving in this 
uncharted territory of these pagans, God is demonstrating his universal mission to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Remember last week we learned that Jesus was supposed to go first to the Jews. And the revelation of Jesus Christ is about to be revealed. God is moving. God is moving right here, right now in Royal Oak. Right now. So the first question Jesus asked, maybe he asked it along the way, maybe they got there and they're shaking the dust off their feet. And he says to his disciples, it's really a twofold question, it's a two-part question. He says, who do people say the son of man is? Now that's a Greek expression, the son of man, you hear that? The, the uh, Jewish expression is Messiah. So those two expressions are interchangeable in scripture. So wherever you hear son of man, it's Messiah. So he says, well, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they answer him and said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Because remember, Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist who, uh, who had come back to haunt him for having taken his head. But others said you're Elijah. Now, Elijah in the Jewish tradition is the herald that will bring about the Davidic Messiah. Elijah will come back and announce that the Messiah is coming. So they think Jesus is a prophet. He's, he's Elijah. And of course, others said that you're Jeremiah or some other prophet. So they all are, are telling him what people are saying about Jesus. And then Jesus kind of turns the game on them. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And I'd ask that question to you. When we had our, our um, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes meetings, um, a couple of Monday nights ago, I asked all of them, I said, who is Jesus to you? What is your relationship with Jesus? And I'd ask you, that's it's rhetorical, if you want, or you can stand up and give a witness, if you want. Who is Jesus to you? What is your relationship with Jesus? Is he friend? Is he your Lord and Savior? And if he is your Lord and Savior, are you obedient to the Lord? There's all kinds of questions in there when someone asks you about who you say Jesus is. Because that name has got power, by the way. That name's got power. You can sit in a conversation and talk about Moses, and, and uh, you can talk about uh, Islam, you can talk about Buddha, and everybody's fine. You mention the name Jesus and people stop. People get hostile sometimes. We don't want to talk about that. That name has power. Ask in my name, Jesus said, and I'll give it to you for the glory of God. So he wants to know what his disciples say he is. And Peter, good old Peter, I love that guy. He, he's the guy, you know, he shoots from the hip, he's bold. He's usually the one who speaks out first in front, instead of the other disciples. He got out of the boat first, you know. Drew his sword against uh, uh, the enemies of Jesus first. He was the first to deny Jesus too. But here he speaks for all the disciples because he says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, son of Jonah. That's his father. He says, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. It wasn't humankind that told you who I was. It was a revelation from God. And any revelation that comes from God is true. Because God cannot lie. God cannot lie. And so he reveals through Peter, through the Holy Spirit. And Peter speaks. Did you notice that after his confession... Jesus calls Peter by that name. Before that, he called him Peter, he called him Simon, son of Jonah, Simon bar Jonah. But now he calls him Peter. Well, in, in Greek, Petra or Petros is the is the name for Peter, but it also means rock. Petros, rock. Hence the city of Petra, Petros. So I'm thinking Jesus is giving him a nickname. He's calling him Rocky. Say Rocky. Wait, 
that would be him answering, oh, what is that, Jesus? Yo. Adrian. Says, you're the son of the living God. He calls him Rocky. And he says, upon this, this declaration, I will build my church. By the way, it's the first time church is mentioned in Matthew and the first time in Scripture in New Testament that church is mentioned. It's not mentioned in the other Gospels. It says, and upon this church I will build, and even the gates of Hades, even the gates of hell won't prevail against this church. And if you think about it, he assigns this task to Peter for what? For what reason? One reason only. What did Peter do? He confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So Jesus' choice for the founder of the church is not because it's arbitrary. Ah, I think I'll pick you. You're the biggest guy in the group. Picked him because he confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then by extension, all others who likewise confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are charged with building Christ's church. That's us. All of us who have called on the name of the Lord, who are saved. And the community, the church that's built on that foundation, all of us who confess Jesus, will prevail. The church will endure until Christ's return. No opinion, no opposition, no even death can't crush this church. Nothing can prevent the ultimate triumph of God's purpose in history, which was what? To reconcile the world to himself. That's what this is all about. Right. Well, this is a book of salvation. This is a book of hearts. God's working acceptable in, in the world sight. to reconcile the world oh, Lord, to himself God, and through rock, salvation. My Redeemer. John Wesley Amen. said, give me one book, this book. That's all I need. That hasn't changed. And then he goes on and says something strange. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What are you talking about, Jesus? Well, in this context, binding and loosing means that Peter and all who share in building Christ's church must accept into the church only those who, like Peter and us, who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That sounds a little exclusive, Pastor. But listen to what we say in our baptismal covenant, which is also the same covenant that we use for receiving members into our church. Listen. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Do you hear the first part of that? If you confess, that's, that is the key to the entry into the church if you're confessing Jesus Christ. See, we welcome the unconverted into the church. We're not exclusive. We welcome him into the church. But this is not the same as acting as if all comers were true disciples of Christ. Just because you walk through that front door doesn't mean you're a disciple of Christ. You could be an enemy of the church coming in. The danger of building a church on those who aren't committed to Jesus Christ is that in time the church will reflect more of the world's values than it reflects Christ's values. And Paul warned us about that. Listen to what he said to Timothy. For, some, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That's a warning about who should be in the church. 
And I look at churches today and I see some things going on and I wonder aloud, are you more worldly or are you more like Christ? And then, after all of this, Jesus orders the disciples sternly, the scripture says, not to tell anybody that he's the Messiah. Isn't that what you want, Jesus? Don't you want the world to know who you are? But Jesus understood. He knew that his disciples were still unprepared to understand and take upon themselves the mission of the cross. Because apart from the cross, they don't grasp the real nation of Jesus' mission. Some years ago, back in, back in World War II, excuse me, my voice is still changing. <laughs> World War II, there was a, um, a German theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Maybe some of you have heard and read about some of his work. Uh, he was a professor of theology at Columbia University, having a comfortable job during the war, but he felt the call to go back to his homeland, Germany, because the church had become divided. There was a church that was the state church that Hitler said, okay, you can still practice, but you have to practice like I want you to practice, the state church. And within that same Lutheran church, there was the Reformation of the Reformed Church. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a part of that. And he came back to work for the cause of faith. And uh, he was arrested and put in a prison camp, a concentration camp. A week before that concentration camp was supposed to be, was liberated by the Allies, he was hanged, martyred. But he wrote a book while he was in there. It was called The Cost of Discipleship. That was the name of the book. And maybe a few uh, um, words into that, that book, he writes these, this word, these words. I'll never forget it. He said, when Christ calls us, he bids us come and die. Striking words. He meant die to your own self in one sense. Die to your own self and, and take up my cross. But he also meant it in a literal sense. You may die for a witness of Jesus Christ. And the disciples weren't ready to grasp that, but they would at his crucifixion and resurrection. You see, Jesus came to take upon himself the sins of the world to suffer and die for us so that through his salvific work, that's a good word, salvific, terrific salvific, through his salvific work, we might be saved. And how are we saved? It's a good sentence for you to remember. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. What's this grace stuff you're talking about, Pastor? Well, grace is this. Grace is God's unmerited love. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can only receive it. Grace is God's unmerited love. He loves you. It pours out. That forgives sins and transforms lives. And when I say transformed, I don't mean changed. I'm not like changing a pair of clothes. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. I'm transformed from my old self to my new self. Grace through faith. What's faith? Well, it's not blind like some people think faith is. Blind is trusting God in our religion, in our faith, in our belief. It's faith, it's trust in God, but it's more than that. It's believing and what is believed. See, it's not just, I believe, because the devil believes and trembles. That's what scripture says. Here, it's the act of believing and what is believed. But what do we believe? Well, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, 
that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. That's scripture. And Jesus cannot lie. And it's the revealed word of God who is incapable of lying. So that's our faith. The act of believing and what is believed. And in who? In Christ. We are saved by, we are saved by faith through grace, or saved by grace through faith in Christ. God incarnate, God made flesh. No other religion can claim that. And this is what is said about that, about that incarnate Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. He was God himself, all-powerful. He could have done anything and exploited anything he wanted, but he didn't. This is what he did. He emptied himself, taking himself, upon himself the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and being found then in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. But here's the rest of that. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that name of power, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, once you know who Jesus is and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, the burden of knowing demands action. You can't sit on the fence if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. He has called you into service. What will you do in your life in the name of Jesus? Amen.